All right, it's time for our next talk. Our next speaker is Nafiul Islam. He's originally from Bangladesh and currently working in Amsterdam. He wrote a book on PyCharm, but today he will talk about something else, which is a GraphQL, a possible replacement for all your REST APIs. So give a warm welcome for Nafiul Islam. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Nafiul, um, in case you were wondering. Um, thank you for coming, for the, coming to this talk. Um, I'm a software engineer at Suit Supply. Um, we sell suits, believe it or not. Uh, <laughs> you can, you can uh, follow me on Twitter, at GamesBrainiac. And uh, a little bit about this talk. This talk is about introducing uh, GraphQL as a technology, and also about introducing Python libraries um, uh, that, that, that can take advantage of this technology. So what exactly is it? Um, to me, GraphQL as a technology is a query language, an interface, and a replacement for REST. Um, GraphQL itself uh, is the query language, but what makes it special is the tooling around it. Um, so let's say you have an order object or table or model or, or, or what have you, um, and it has an ID, um, an order status, uh, line items, Delivered, which should be is delivered because it's a Boolean. Um, delivered date, store name, currency, and order type. So line items basically contain, contains all the items in a particular order. And the, and the query that you would make uh, to, Graph, to a GraphQL service is you would say, hey, I want an order uh, with the ID of T3JK, whatever that is. And then you would have order type, status. And since line items is a list of things, you would say, for every line item, you want a line item ID. So let's get into the anatomy of things. So this is, you want an order with an ID of. These are the attributes that you want. And this is an embedded object. We just want the line item ID for the order's line items. All right? And this is, um, this is the, the resultant uh, JSON. Um, delivery date is obviously null because it's not been delivered. Um, and this is an API that we're actually using internally at Suit Supply. Uh, it's, it's our orders API. So, uh, yeah. So we only get the, we, we get the response in JSON and we really just get only the attributes that we asked for. Um, and the interface that, that we are using in order to sort of test out the service is called graphical. It's not spelled incorrectly. It's actually G-R-A-P-H-I-Q-L. Um, and you know, even, even GitHub is using this uh, for its version 4 API. Um, so here are some graphical features. You have uh, code completion for attributes. So for example, if you're looking up order um, and you type in OR as one of the attributes, it gives you order ID, order type, order status. Um, I don't know why it's giving you store ID, but uh, yeah. Um, other GraphQL features includes the documentation explorer. So you know exactly what kind of objects that you're dealing with. So here, for example, we have the order node connection. And in order node, it has ID, SFID, order ID, order status, currency, created date, and shipping code. So you know exactly uh, what you're dealing with and what the types of those respective attributes are. So you, know, you don't have to take my word for it that you know, these are great features. Um, GitHub is actually using this for their version 4 uh, API. So they had REST all this time, and now they're just uh, switching over uh, to GraphQL. And um, this, this Octocad is actually uh, just saying something from one of their blog posts, which is um, uh, GraphQL for API version 4 because it offers significantly more flexibility to our integrators. And I'll get into that. So, um, because I'm not a fan of uh, live demos that include internet, I, I created, a, I cheated, and I uh, created a recording. Where on earth is my mouse? So uh, this is this is this is actually their uh, console. You know, I'm not going to explain everything that's happening here, but this is what it's like to uh, to actually query graph uh, to GitHub data right now. So you create a query. Um, Viewer is basically uh, what you're logged in as. That is your user. And inside viewer, you can get login, which is your login name. I'm Games Brainiac on GitHub as well. 
Um, and so you could get the avatar URL, and you can get code completion, you get followers. You can get the total counts, and you can get, so they implement a the node pattern, so you can get you know, each of the logins um, for my followers. So you know, the usernames that are following me and the total count of how many people are following me. So you run that, but you have an error, right? Because I have so many followers, uh, GitHub is basically saying you need to provide a first and last uh, input. So we're just gonna do that right now. I'm gonna say, I want the first 10. We're gonna execute that and voila, you have the first 10. And yeah, you can get the avatar URL. You can also do something really meta, which is you can get the followers of your followers. And <laughs> you, can, you can actually get the total count for each of them. And you can see that some of my followers have more followers than me, which is, uh, yeah, that's where it's at. Um, <laughs> so are we done with that? Oh, man, really? OK, so, so why GraphQL over REST, right? That's, that's the real question to ask um, is because there's a standard, there's a clear definition of what is GraphQL. Nobody's going to fight over, everybody's really fighting over what is a RESTful service. You know, can you create something with a put request and a GUID? Can you really? I don't know. Um, there is, there is um, a good development environment, so graph, uh, Graphical provides documentation, query validation, as well as code completion. You know, I think everybody loves code completion here. Um, you get exactly what you want, right? So we've seen that we asked for our only particular attributes um, of uh, an object, and we got exactly that. Um, you know the exact types. There's lower network overhead because you can actually bundle queries together, and there's no, uh, there's no versioning. So, for example, you create a model. You can create aliases to that model, and people who are... Who are who clients who are using the old version can keep using it, and you just have kind of like an append-only uh, schema where you're just adding functionality, and when people stop using the old functionality, it just gets de it's, you just delete it. Um, you can, of course, add depreciation warnings to any of the models that are particularly old. So, you know, you're in good company. Uh, lots of people are, are, are using it, um, including Yelp. I think Yelp's in the audience. Um, Daily Motion, GitHub, obviously, Facebook, where it was originated. Um, even a company called Bazinga, like it's Bazinga. So, um, so you know, probably you're asking at this point in time. So, I get all of that; it's all good. But what does what does Python have to offer? And it has this cute little nifty library called Graphene. So, it's a GraphQL implementation. Um, for Python, it's very popular. It's second only to the Facebook implementation. It has many production users, um, Yelp, Dailymotion, and, and, and Mozilla. Um, I got this from, from the Graphene website, so yeah. Um, how, you know, it, it's got integration with popular uh, frameworks like Django, uh, Flask, and Pyramid. It also has integrations with popular ORMs. So um, you can actually reuse a lot of your model code if you've already lit written it. Um, in these things. So let's build a to-do API, of course. Um, but first, let's get some terminology down. Types and objects are basically like serializers in, in GraphQL. So if you've used something like Django REST framework, you have a model and you have a serializer with really just spits out JSON, right? Um, you have a schema, which, con which contains all the GraphQL types at your disposal. You have, you know, a resolver is basically a function that is executed to return a particular attribute of an object. You have a query, which is um, you get all, you, you get or set data in, in, in GraphQL and you have mutations. So the reason I say this right now is because I'm gonna be using this terminology quite a lot. Just to, um, in case you don't understand anything, you can just go back to this slide and just say, okay, so that's what he was talking about. Um, so we, we're gonna use uh, SQL Alchemy as our ORM. They inherit from base. They also inherit from primary key mix in. Of course, we're, we're heading towards a demo, so I'm just uh, showing off some of, the, some of the models that we're using. It's uh, pretty, pretty simple. We've got a primary key mixin that we're adding in. Um, uh, the user, the user uh, model is, 
is inheriting from base, which is from declarative base in SQL Alchemy. Um, it's got the username, which is of type string, email of type string, and it has to do's, uh, which is a relationship. And here you have the to-do object. It's got a title. It's got a connection to the user, and it's got items, which are to-do items. It also has some meta info, which is a JSONB because we're using Postgres. You have the to-do item, which has a description, is done, which is a Boolean, and priority. Okay? So these are the graphene objects, you know? And that's, that's what you have for user. You just say that the model is user. Lots of black magic going on here. You have the to-do object. Um, so if you have uh, a part a special types, you need to use uh, graphene.field JSON string because we're using a JSON type for it. Um, you have the to-do item object, nothing special here. And now we can head over to the demo because I'm just asking for trouble. Uh, let's see. All right. So let's just let's just take a look at let's just take a look at the uh, query class. So in the query class, we have a user. It's a field. It's going to return a user object type, right? Which we've discussed before. It takes an ID as an input, which is graphene.int. It also takes, it can also take username as an input. And this is where the magic happens. We are resolving user on the, on, on the query model. So here, we're getting um, the query object. We're saying filter by the arguments that you're providing. So args contains all the arguments that you're providing in your GraphQL query. And then we're just returning query.first. So let's take a look at how that works. Oops. So you can see, let me just get rid of, uh, get rid of this. You have query, you have user, you want the username, right? And let's see what we have here, control space, we want the ID, the username, we also want email, to-dos, and inside of to-dos we want title, we want items, and inside of items we want description, priority, probably also want the ID. So yeah, let's, uh, let's get rid of the query variables. So let's execute that. So as you can see here, I'm asking for the user. It's got an ID of one. It's got an email of this. Um, and it's got to-dos, title, prepare for GraphQL. Um, and you have items here, ID of three, make sure to add um, order model for priority. I can also just add, ask for meta info. And this is, the, this is the one thing that I wanted to show you. This is an escaped JSON string. So how does this all map into the Python code? So we're resolving user, right? What does, user, what does the user object have? It's got an ID of int. It goes back to model user. And here we have all the information. Um, if you want to take a look at the mutations, uh, let me just comment that out. If you want to take a look at the mutations, which is how we create or update stuff. So you have a mutation here. And what we want to do is create a user. The username is going to be um, SpongeBob. Uh, and the email is going to be SquarePants at bottom.com, right? And what we want here is we want the user back, we want the ID, and we want to know, oh, where's my cursor going? We want to know if, it's, if everything was okay. So yeah, it's created, it's got an ID of 34, and yeah, it's, it works. So let's take a look at our old friend SpongeBob here. Let me just comment that out. Query, user, username, SpongeBob, username, email, probably has no to-dos. There you go. So what, you know, we just used a mutation here, but how do mutations look like? 
Let me just full screen this. Okay, is that better? Okay. So take a look at create user. What we have is a class graphene.mutation. Uh, create user class, it inherits from graphene.mutation. Um, it's got an input here. It's got username. It's got email. And here is what it actually returns, the user and OK. And this is where all the magic happens. Oops. This is where all the magic happens. You have a mutate method. This can also be a class method. Um, we're just starting a session here, a SQL Alchemy session. We're creating um, a new user here. We're adding it to the session. We're committing it. And then we're returning, basically, uh, user is equal to you and OK is equal to true. Now, all of that information, how do I? So all of that information is actually available and generated for you in the docs. So you have, uh, you have the mutations. You can actually take a look at all the mutations that I've created. So we have a create user. It takes a username of type string, um, email of type string, and it returns a user and an OK, which is a Boolean. <coughs> Similarly, you have um, to do. Uh, delete to do, add to do item, etc. All of this. Stuff. So this code will be available um, for you to play around with um, because I think I'm running out of time. But so going back here, uh, going back here, So how does this, so I'm using Flask here, but how does this integrate into Flask? So from Flask GraphQL, we're just importing GraphQL view. We're adding a URL rule. We're saying, we're just taking it as view. We're naming it Graph, GraphQL. We point to the schema. The schema is over here. The schema is basically a composition of the query, the stuff that you want to get, and the mutations, the stuff that you want to change. And and uh, yeah, and we said graphical is to true because we want that endpoint to show the graphical user interface. So let's actually add a resolver uh, to user. We have def, um, sorry, uh, something random, graphene.string, def resolve. Oops, underscore something random, and you have args, context, info. And what you're going to be basically doing here is just returning uh, something, oops, self dot something, oops, sorry. Return args dot get something random. So if I have my thing running. Oh, okay, so it already compiled. Let me just restart this. Uh, please, internet work. Pretty please. <laughs> okay, so, but basically what would have happened is you would have seen something random appear as a possible attribute, it would have appeared on the user object and would have been of type string. So anytime you want to add an attribute, you just add a method called resolve underscore that particular attribute and you'll get what you want. So now that my demo is done, <laughs> um, a, f uh, a last few things. Um, take a look at the graphing documentation. There are some errors in it. Uh, So, for example, where did it all go? Where is everything? Um, so here, for example, uh, in mutations, uh, this is an older uh, documentation set, so it's saying class arguments. But here in the documentation, it says input attributes. So just remember, if you want to add inputs to your model, just name it input, not arguments. Um, So we didn't go into the data loader. The data loader is basically the caching system that you have for, for GraphQL. Probably some people are asking, so 
how do you cache this thing? That's how you do it. Uh, you also have middleware. I know everybody loves middleware um, for authentication. 2.0 um, is coming out soon, I would have said, because I, I prepared this presentation yesterday, but today I just checked the Graphene website. 2.0 is out, which has a lot of bug fixes and everything. So, you know. Um, the Django integration is better than the SQL Alchemy integration. Um, I have to say that grudgingly. I don't really like Django all that much. Um, <laughs> and uh, many changes in the way, including um, direct AST transformation for queries, so no compile time overhead. Um, there's plenty to do. It's an exciting space. So come in and join the action. Thank you very much. This is the point where I try to run away, but uh, apparently I have to do questions, so let's do this. Yeah, so let's, give him, let's give him some questions. How do you handle uh, validation of inputs? Uh, creating a user, you just add more fields for response? or? Uh, what so are you talking about the types of the inputs or, or um, no I mean if user posts in valid email how do you you handle that in the mutate function so for example oh. uh. okay never mind so you ha so remember when we were talking about mutations and we, were, we had arguments, args.get, uh, whatever um, the argument it was, you can, you can get that in information and validate it over there. Um, you can add uh, a method to the SQL Alchemy model itself that will validate that, in, uh, validate that input. But most of the time, you auto have automatic type validation. So. Yes, but how you communicate this to the user? Oh, the so, so for example, you're trying to create something new. You can add like, a, like, a, like on the mutation object that we, like for example, in create a user, you had uh, the user object as well as OK, but you can also add like a message, graphene.string, and you can say, hey, that, that username or that email is totally bogus. So you can do that as right. well. Thank you. More questions? Uh, when dealing with this graphene data types, you had graphene string and graphene integer. Mm -hmm. So what's the, different to the uh, difference to the Python data types? Uh, Why do you need this graphene dot whatever? Yeah, graphene dot whatever. So they, they do have, they have uh, a lot of different types of uh, data types. So you have scalars um, like int and string, but you also have complex object types. You can declare your object types. You can um, uh, inherit from graphene dot object type create your own object. Um, there is clear translation between int and string and uh, boolean and date time already built into graphene. So you don't have to build anything for that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but why should I just write string or Python uh -huh. and the API translated to whatever is needed? I think that work is being done on that, but oh. it's not there yet. So okay. right now, if you want to declare a string, it's graphene.string or graphene.int. Also. That is, that is a field. So it can actually take in arguments like description, um, whether it's depreciated or not, and, and things like that. So it's not just, um, like I used, I used a pretty simple version of it, but you can add arguments to it that gives you more features. Uh, maybe a question about the versioning. You say that uh, the API should be changed by just appending to it, um, yep. or creating new um, queries. Um, is this really a good idea, just limiting your design choices in Designing an API? Well, when designing an API, I mean, you can, you can have create user that takes in maybe two arguments or three arguments, and later on you say, hey, we just need one argument, which is the, which is the um, username. And the people who are already using your API can keep using the previous, um, uh, what do you call it, mutation. And, if you, and you can say that, hey, this is depreciated now, but you can still use it. And when that usage just goes down to zero when nobody's really using it anymore because they get tired of the depreciation warnings, you can just say, you could just get rid of it. So ideally, you, you know, you don't, you can, you can add new features without breaking changes, which is, I think, a pretty great thing. More questions or comments? So how many people are already using GraphQL in their own projects? Okay, not many hands. <laughs> great, like one guy. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see how this changes next year. So let's thank the speaker again for this nice talk about GraphQL. Thank you.